basically I've got Patterdale Terriers same thing growing up all the old boys had a Patterdale kicking around the kennels it's kind of tradition so when they had the allotments and you keep chickens and stuff you've always got rats so they used to have little ratters and funnily enough it was never Jack Russells or foxes it was just scruffy Patterdales mm-hmm. and uh I was over here, I'd been over in France for a fair few years, and I was down in Marseille, and a guy who works uh, with me in the kennels, he said to me one day, he said, um, do you know uh, anything about Patterdale Terriers? And uh, it was funny, coming from a guy from Marseille, I said, well, yeah, of course. And he said, well, my brother-in-law's got a litter. And I said, well, anyway, we were speaking, and it turns out, they were extremely well-bred Patterdales, and he just had a litter like that. Do you want one? So I, I took one back to the kennels, and she was great. But she was a little, uh, I don't know if I sent you a photo, she was a small bitch, about seven, eight kilos. Wonderful dog, moved around a lot with me, and when I came to my farm here, she escaped on her own, went over the fields and went hunting. And she didn't come back for a couple of days. And when she came back, she had her head bowed. Um, she managed to come back to the house. And when I lifted up her head, she had no throat. It had been torn out. So she was breathing through the hole in her throat. So I got her to the vets. We saved her. They operated. She woke up the next day, but then she passed away. Mm-hmm. So, and that was Badger. Badger, nasty, nasty. And so I always had in mind that a seven or eight kilo Patterdale, if ever he's up against something a little bit strong, it's not enough. Now, I'm a big fan of the Yag Terrier as well. Only the Yag Terrier is crazy. It's a kamikaze dog. It prefers to die than anything. It's just mad. So I liked the two breeds so being myself I decided to cross them so and the result is very good the result if you like you've got that hardness of the yacht with the hardness of the smaller Patterdale yet the Patterdale brings reason to the mix Mm -hmm. so he's not as kamikaze as he should be or you know so Mm -hmm. it's something that I did a while ago with good results and a friend of mine, Robert Booth, uh, he did uh, he did the same, and he gave me a pup uh, a while ago. So I've got Frank, who's here, Mad Frank, and uh, a couple of breeders I worked with in Portugal gifted me a couple of uh, sisters, Patterdales, very nice broken coats, and um, so that's my little program. I've got my Yag Pat mix with two Patterdales, and. Uh, I've got a little male, funnily enough, that's the spitting image of his dad, even though we'd say he's 75% Patterdale, 25% Yag. Um, he's been sold about 15 times, but there's always an excuse. So I'm thinking, well, you know what? Maybe it's a sign he should stay here. So he might stay here and, and carry on in the program. So that's just a bit of fun. I mean, I've got rats here, I've got uh, some Spanish game fowl, and uh, because I'm deep in, in the middle of nowhere, you get the field rats coming over, because obviously where there's chickens, there's, there's grain. So we have great fun, you know. Yeah. In the evening, dusk, you know, boom. If you catch them in a, a live trap and then let them out to the, the dogs as well. So. A uh, couple of beers set up in the window with your, your little tutu air rifle as well. That is great fun. Yeah, so, yeah. That's just a... a the Terriers um, is far easier because it's the old-fashioned handwritten pedigrees. You know, you're judged on your merit. You know, they don't sell for very much. They're not that interesting for people. Uh, so you do what you want. Uh, Patterdale's are renowned for having a little mix of Stafford blood or Pitt blood or other terrier blood and it, it's because you know whatever works and so um, that's just something for uh, for me 
Mm-hmm. I like to have a scruffy little terrier kicking about. It's useful. Yeah. You know, it can go places that a Stafford can't. I mean, for example, I can let the small terrier go to the, the chicken coop and they won't touch the chickens. But if I was to let one of the Staffords in, there would be no more chickens because he would do the chickens and the rats. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's. Uh, but that's, that's part of my. I'm a Stafford man at heart. Bulldogs were my business. The Bulldog brand was my business for many years. So I was known for that. So you know, I've always got a type of Bulldog. Uh, the English Bulldog program was to prove a point. It can be done. Now it's easier to kick about with some of my olds that are here. A bit of fun. Um, I've got a nice old that was gifted to me from England uh, the other day. I've put Marcel, my dusty son, dusty cuckoo son, over. So I'm expecting a litter at the end of the month. That should be interesting because it's my stuff crossed with Victorian Levitt lines. Okay. So you've got a breeding, a nice program in England and the UK, which is, I think, 75% Victorian crossed with Levitt. So bring that across and cross it with what I've done. Could be, could be good. Could be good. So like I say, Staffords, Bulldogs, the little bit of Terrier, and the odd Gamecock, and, and we're good, and we're good. So, but it's funny because I, I used to run bars and restaurants for years. Mm-hmm. I ran them for other people, uh, then I bought my own, um, I developed a concept, ran that on for years. But I always wanted to not earn a living, but be comfortable and do what I want to do, dogs. So when I sold all my businesses, I became a troubleshooter for, for bars and restaurants and businesses that were going down here. You know, you go in and you help them with their stats and rebuilding. But it was always, I was in a hurry to get back home to the dogs. So whilst I was doing that, I took a, a master's in coaching and basically very expensive. But at the end of it, the, 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 the thing is basically life's short, do, do what makes you happy. And that, that stuck with me and dogs make me happy. Everything around dogs makes me happy. But when you're around dogs and you, you breed ethically like we do, you're never going to be rich. Mm-hmm. But, but if you can make enough money to, to get by, good enough. So for the minute, I'm concentrating on my dogs. I, I got a little bit disillusioned about five years ago with the politics and the crap that was going on in France. So I, I took my, my foot off the pedal a little bit, just coasted along. And I saw that, you know, nature follows its course and, you know, all the crap is starting to leave. So I've come back into it again, but uh, with a renewed passion, there's a few sort of little projects that I want to get off the ground. Um, do like the ideas of the podcast as well. Very interesting. Because that's one way of getting a message across to the maximum amount of people. You see, if you've got a website, people have to go to your website. But when you're on a YouTube or whatever, and you, you like you do, mm-hmm. um, it very quickly gets viewed by lots of people. So, yeah. so that's that's the plan. It's going to be dogs. Going to be living in the country. Going to be chasing rats and rabbiting and doing what I'm doing. Eating well and getting fat. <laughs> and, uh, drinking good wine. Yeah. Well, you know, what what else? What else? And I wouldn't mind travelling a bit. It's like I'm, I'm judging a bit at the moment. At the end of the month, I'll be judging uh, an old bulldog show in the south of France, that would be interesting. Uh, I was asked to judge in Paris uh, American Bulldogs, but less interest in that. Uh, judging the Stafford sporting shows is always fun, so I might be doing a bit of that. And I, I would like to actually, you know, get around to some of the old timers that are still about in the UK and Ireland, and maybe like me, not, not a podcast, but get down in writing as much as you can before it's too late because, you know, time is moving on and the last generation 
I remember, yeah, there's a, a dear woman that, that sold me Billy, my dog, the, the black dog by. I think she's 90 years old now. Uh, she was still showing and judging, and she stopped judging the day that she couldn't bend down mm -hmm. to, to go over the dog. And they said, well, we'll put the dogs on a bench for you. And she said, the day that the Staffordshire Bull Terrier is judged on a bench is the day that I retire from judging. Mm -hmm. And funnily enough, in France, the Stafford is often judged on benches now. Could you imagine the, the shame of it? Mm -hmm. A fighting dog is now judged like a poodle. So, ah. But anyway, I, I, I'm invited to Southern Ireland uh, end of this year with a bit of luck get down to those old smoky pubs and start talking serious dogs and you know, go out with the, the, the boys you know, over the fields with some whippets and stuff and lurches and uh, that would be good. Document a bit of uh, a few bits and pieces. Um, basically, you know, you know, just keep alive all the sort of, you know, the, the authentic stuff, the original stuff, the mm -hmm. tradition. If you can keep that alive and pass that on, uh, I think that would be good because, you know, the trouble is with Generation Facebook is, uh, you know, people are under the impression that the Stafford is, is a new uh, sort of mod that, that was, you know, come about in the last 25 years. You know, when you start talking about hundreds of years ago, this and that, it doesn't interest them, you know. And we've got to find a way of uh, keeping that tradition alive so people are interested and they want to go because who reads books these days? You know, I've got a library downstairs, but nobody reads books. They just Google it. Mm -hmm. I take two minutes, I'll Google it, I'll get a snippet of information, and that's me done. Mm -hmm. No, I dig out a book, go on eBay, go look for the old books, look for titles, recommended books, take your time, switch your telephone off, read a book, go into the information. Who wants to do that today? So. You know, I'm, I kind of feel like my lot is in the middle. You know, kind of the pet, the show people to to the working people. I feel like my directory is in the middle. Uh, it does exist. In the middle. Well, I'm pretty much in the middle because although I like judging the 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 sporting shows, I don't compete. I've had dogs that compete, but personally, again, a lot of people know my views, but I see the reasoning behind the 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 dog shows and the events, you know, to, to push the dog to its limit and see which dog goes a little bit further. I like that. It's the mental test. And yeah, it's good. But me personally, to get my dog to go 50 times up and down an A-frame in 60 seconds, I don't see the point. You know, I, I wouldn't, you know, how would you say? insult my dog's intelligence by getting a dog to just go up and down the thing as fast as he can I can see why people do it me personally I wouldn't want to do it uh, you get a, a bike and do 10 kilometers with a dog jogging along yeah okay I'm with you I, I see that you put your boots on and a rucksack and you go up into the hills all day picnic at the top bit of, nice bit of bread and cheese bottle of wine that I'm with you I can see that but you know, there's, you've got to be in the middle. The show fraternity is all wrong. There's extreme sporting fraternity, although it's all right, it's going extreme again. You've got to be between the two. So I prefer a dog that leans towards the athletic capable dogs rather than the, the show potatoes. But at the same time, me personally, I'm pretty much in the middle. I appreciate a nice looking dog but I appreciate a dog that's capable so do you do you foresee uh, an ability and this is my pie in the sky you know naive point of view in mind uh, you know I know that life experiences you know can can change your opinion but can there be a happy medium as far as having a working style dog but also be decent in the show ring would that mean that the yes. standards would need to change would that you know would it need to go to more towards a working style dog standard or it would mean uh, education and it would mean 
you, you, uh, I mean, back in 1990, the Stafford shows were like that. The dogs that were shown were dogs that could work. I mean, they were. And if you went to the Southern Wales competition, I mean, it was allegedly they used to roll their dogs on a Saturday morning. I mean, you got some really good, hard dogs there. Real Staff, the real Stafford fraternity went there. Um, you know, those were the days where, you know, it really was, I was like a, a kid in a sweet shop. Uh, you know, it was just fantastic. But today, the, the, uh, it seems to me that the owners have changed, the mentality has changed, maybe the, the type of people attracted to the dog has changed, therefore they're changing the dog to suit them. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So today, when you go to a dog show, you think, well, it's not that. For me, I haven't changed. I've always liked a certain type of dog. But now what I see isn't pleasing to me. So I think it's just a question of people have changed and ideals have changed. And the fact that everybody's in a hurry now and nobody has the patience to delve into the history of the breed and learn and absorb and appreciate they want it now and they want it quick and so they go onto the internet they see the flashy marketing and so they buy that and the dog that they get looks like that and that'll do and then they show that and everything's quick and then the people that pay a lot of money say well i paid that therefore i need a return on investment so how how long before i can have pups with this and so you quickly spiral out of control. But I think the Stafford is teetering. The Bulldog has gone over the edge and probably could be saved. But your idea isn't naive because it can, it could be done. If I would, I would imagine if you had good fit, healthy Bulldogs, but pure at country shows and bits and pieces, lots of photos and good articles. I think that would encourage a certain amount of people to appreciate what you do. Do you know what I mean? I think, you know, it's not, you know, certainly, what, 30 years ago that the Staffords were the real thing, mm -hmm. and today they're not. And people say, yeah, oh, well, you know, they still exist. Of course they still exist. But what I've seen, I mean, I watched Crufts uh, on the television this year. I mean, there wasn't a dog there that stood out for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember in 2012, it was Sarah Hemstock that judged from Jolly M. Kennels. And uh, I was with the, the, the French, and they said, oh, who do you think is going to win then? And there was one dog, it was an Irish girl, showing the dog, and he had such um, a prestance, such a presence. I mean, he was there, and you know, all eyes on him. He was, a, you know, and there was a little Irish girl with red hair showing him. And uh, I thought, that's this is, is, is she's going to win. That that dog's going to win. And they did. Mm -hmm. uh, Forty. That was the winner. And so I went and chatted to the Irish guys, and I said, "What's the pedigree?" And it was just scatterbred, you know. And so the straight away the French were like, "Yeah, we're going to use this dog on some of our dogs." And I said, "That's not going to give you anything." You know, this is scatter bread, and what you've got isn't that. It's, yeah, well, it won crafts. So what? It, it was the best dog of the day, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean it's going to save the breed. You know, it doesn't mm -hmm. mean it's going to. And that's the problem. You know, they're not looking to improve on it. I was always told if you're going to breed dogs, the generation have to be better quality than the parents. And if it's not the case after two or three generations, you should either stop or have a big rethink about what's gone wrong. Mm -hmm. the, the pups in the litter should be better than the parents that you bred them from. That's the direction you go in. If it's not the case, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we had the, the argument of the colour blue, people said. The first blue stuff that came to France was me that brought it in, but not for the colour, it was the pedigree. It was the old lines because mm -hmm. in the 80s the English exported lots of dogs to Australia and funnily enough 20 years later the Australians had some bloody good dogs and the English started lacking so I paid out of my pocket to bring a bitch back 
and based that on my kennels with the black dog and produce some cracking dogs. But the colour means nothing to me, you know. As the Irish would say, you know, a good horse is never the wrong colour. It's exactly the same for dogs. We don't care what colour it is. Mm -hmm. Would the colour help the dog if it was in the pit? Not really. Colour is just cosmetic. Mm -hmm. And so people go, yeah, now people are saying, yeah, well, blues are sick. No, they're not all sick. It's just, if you think about it logically, blue is a recessive of black. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to have, because they sell blues for a lot of money, if you want to have blues, you breed two blues together. But what are you doing? You're breeding two recessives together. Recessive plus recessive means that the pups can't be better quality than the parents. Mm -hmm. And if you do that for a while, Mother Nature steps in and punishes you. The immune system drops, and that's where you start getting LOPC and all, all the, the hair drops out of the dogs. But it's not the colour that makes them sick, it's the mm -hmm. stupid people that don't use it right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I once years ago paid out of my own pocket to bring a, a doctor, um, uh, Archie Bryden, who's one of the top uh, specialists in the UK, brought him to France to give a conference on to, to basically blow up all these myths that were being spread about. And he said, if you got a blue, mate it to a solid uh, uh, black coloured dog, dark brindle, that uh, you know, doesn't carry blue, job done. Mm -hmm. But, you know, nobody listened. So, and this is this is the trouble. It's you know, you can talk to your blue in the face, but you know, if, mm -hmm. if people have got an agenda, whether it be money, whether it be you know, self fame or whatever, they're not going to listen to you. So, unfortunately, the, very often the, the breeds, different breeds, pay the price because it's the humans behind them that have their own sort of criteria, mm -hmm. whether it be money, fame. You know, I've produced a, a Crafts winner, by example, you know, so it's, uh, I don't know, like I said, you could talk for hours. Mm -hmm. I think what, what you're planning to do is, you know, pr promoting healthy dogs isn't that difficult to do. The next question is, will people sit up and take note? That's, that's, that's where your problem's going to be. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can do it. No, it's not a miracle to make fit bulldogs. They do exist. But do people want that? Will they appreciate it? And no, that's a whole different different mm -hmm. question. You know, so. <clears throat> One last question before I let you, uh, let you go is, um, say there is a new breeder, um, and you're talking to them, what are you looking for in a stud, and what are you looking for in a bitch? What what are the qualities, uh, specific qualities that you're looking when you're about ready to, to do a breeding? If I personally work my own stock, but if I was giving advice to somebody starting out, I would say that your key to any kennels is the, the brood bitch. You've got to have a quality bitch. So you have to do your homework. You have to have in your mind's eye what for me is the perfect Staffordshire Bull Terrier, Bulldog, whatever. What to me is perfect. And you should never sway from this, this idea. So you get in mind, this is what I want in a Staffordshire Bull Terrier. Okay, you got it. It's photographed in your mind. Now you go looking for it. You scour the internet if need be. You speak to people. You know, you write letters, emails, whatever. You need to find something that corresponds with what you want. Now, this is why I'm saying patience comes into play. When you, you find what you want, you organize a visit and you go and you've got a list of questions and a good breeder will, will welcome you with open arms. A puppy miller will not be happy because he hasn't got time to, to answer your questions because he's waiting for the next customer. But a real genuine breeder will welcome you in and you ask all the questions and you want to see the bitch is from a line of bitches that have a strong maternal instinct, uh, no problems with complications with whelping, with caesareans and all that. And you want to have a history, at least for two, three generations, a history of good, strong bitches that produce well. You know, they fit the standard, 
nice looking if need be, correct temperament, you, you want that. But the maternal instinct has to be strong. For example, the, the Bull Terrier uh, fraternity had problems because they forgot about that. And Bull Terriers were notoriously bad mothers. They trampled the pups, they'd eat the pups. You know, they were notoriously bad. The Staffordshire Bull Terrier genuinely is an easy breed for breeding. So I would look for the base, a good, well-bred bitch with a good history behind her. But once you've got that, you can choose any stud dog on the planet. You only have to pay the stud fee. So the key to your kennels is the bitch. Mm -hmm. Now, you have your bitch, that's, that's the prize, that's the golden egg. You got your bitch, you want to work her, you want to get her right. Now, afterwards you have to be honest, and this is where the kennel blindness comes in for the majority. You have to be 100% honest, objective, you have to say, right, okay, what are the qualities of my bitch, but what are the defaults? What, what, is, what, what would I want to improve on? And you note them. And then you go looking for a stud. Now the stud should be, for me, similar lines to your bitch. That way you know that through the generations you're not going to stray off, there's not going to be too many surprises. Similar lines to your bitch, not necessarily too close, but similar. After that, the stud dog that I want, there is no exaggeration. For example, people often make the mistake, if the, the, the ear carriage of your dog isn't, isn't 100%, they recompensate. For example, if, if a dog has ears that are a little bit flighty, they'll go for a male dog with heavy ears, which is a mistake. Because what you're doing is you're actually going for two faults. He's got heavy ears, she's got light ears. Do you think that the heavy ears is gonna cancel out the light ears and it's gonna meet in the middle? No. You're bringing two faults to the table. So what you need to do is just go for your Bulk basic, dog with no exaggeration, very good, uh, very good example of the breed, but with, with no, uh, like I said, there's, there's no, nothing over exaggerated in him. He's just a good typical dog with lines similar to yours. And then we go to character. He's got to have that sparkle. He's got to be up on his toes. He's got to want to meet the bitch. He's got to be... He's got to be a bit pugnacious. That's what we want in the Staffords. Mm -hmm. If you can walk him on a lead, you know, you want to see if there's a bit of tension in the lead when he sees another dog. He's, so when you know that that's the, the package that I want, you can do the mating because you've got your prize bitch. You've got something that, that ticks all the boxes, put them together, and then comes the selection. The selection, when they have the pups, you've got to know what you're looking for. This is why... In your mind's eye, you have to have that blueprint mm -hmm. of the Stafford that you've always wanted. Don't be swayed, oh, this little one is cute, I like this one, or this one's got a little bit of white on his tail, let's keep this one. No, pull that to side, and you've got to look for the, the dog that has that certain something, that mm -hmm. sparkle that ticks the boxes that you want. Because what I like isn't necessarily what you like. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? So you've got to be honest with yourself, and you've got to try and put aside all the sort of emotional, you know, the, the stuff that seduces you. And, you know, your missus quite likes that one because, you know, no, you, you got to stick to your guns, pick the dog, and you've got to be prepared because it could happen. In a litter of pups, maybe there's nothing of interest for you. So you sell them on, but the ideal breeder keeps something back or places something for the next generation. Mm -hmm. Be very aware of people that just sell off their stock because it's purely for monetary gain. Mm -hmm. If you're breeding, it should be with an idea to continue. Mm -hmm. If not, you do a, a litter just, for, just to pay the bills. So this is, you know, the serious ethic and these, you know, the opportunists again. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, if I was gonna break it down, I'd say the bitch is the most important. But make sure you get a well-bred bitch. That's the golden egg. Choose carefully and don't hesitate to, you know, the guy that you brought the bitch from, ask him, what does he think? You explain to him, this is the type of dog I want, this is the style I want, I want a, a dog that's not too heavy because I want to do some sport, I want to do this, I want to do that. Not really interested in the shows, don't you know? 
if the guy's honest, he'll say, oh, okay, well, you want to use this stunt dog then. For example, you know, if you wanted to do the show stuff, well, the guy that's winning at the moment is this guy. So you've got to be honest again. Don't mm-hmm. be shy to explain, explain mm-hmm. yourself, to explain, you know, to, do, to, to say what you want. So the bitch first, the male second, and then comes the selection. And the selection is made easier if you've done your homework and you've read up and you've visited and you've gone to dog shows and you've, you've studied the form and you've seen how they move, what they are. When I was starting out, I used to get to the, 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 the show at 8.30, it would be maybe 100 or 200 miles away from my house. I had a girlfriend at the time had an old blue Fiesta, so I used to borrow that and I'd drive up the motorway on a Sunday morning. And I'd get to the, the show, straight away I'd get the catalogue, get my front seat and I wouldn't move. I would guard that seat like an Italian mother Mm -hmm. and I'd be there and I'd be watching the form from puppy through to veteran, I'd be watching everything and I was obsessed and I would be making the links, what kennels were working out, how's this with that and in the old days you used to have a bar so at 12 o'clock when everybody broke you would put your bag on your seat so nobody stole your seat and you go to the bar and that's where the magic happened. That's where you heard the old boys planning their matings and this and that. And that's where you should listen in. Mm. You get your pint, you listen in, and you take notes. And But again, it was something that we used to do, and it just doesn't happen now. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a shame. But um, if you, like I say, if you, if you really want to get into it, you, you, know, you get out of it, what you put in is cliche. Mm-hmm. But uh, you've got to learn. You've got to become obsessed. You've got to, you know, eat, sleep, drink that. You've got to ask the questions. You know, if you've got to push the boundaries. It's easier with internet at the same time. But you've got to scratch below the surface. Internet will give you a quick answer. But you know, don't be afraid to to ask, double check, see with somebody else. You, know, and, and you have to always be a little bit wary of people that bad mouth other, other breeders. Mm-hmm. Because he works that way doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. It's not right for you, but it doesn't mean it's wrong. So let them do what they do, and you do what you do, and everybody leaves happily, you know? Right. So how many times have you run up someone for advice, and all they do is just badmouth the other guys? Yeah, well, he does this, and he's shit, and he's bad, and you never know what he did. I'm not interested in that. Mm -hmm. I said, if I'm dealing with dogs, I'm dealing with the dogs. I don't care about the owners too much mm-hmm. you know they've got their, 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 their baggage their luggage I'm looking for the dogs mm-hmm. I mean you know I knew some of the old characters I knew you know you wouldn't you know, bring them home to meet your mother you know these, these was bad men mm-hmm. but they produced these, you know, cracking dogs mm-hmm. so it's, you know, let you know them be judged for what they've done but their dogs you know, and I say that I say that about the self. I say, you know, people can say what they like about me, but you can't, you know, you can't be said. If you, my dogs don't please you, if they're not what you're looking for, you can't say the bad dogs. No. You know? So basically, I'm happy with what I produced. People are happy. They produce like they produced. Many generations out there now. Um, I think we're we're on the right track. Mm-hmm. So people have their, you know, opinions on me, but you know, the dogs are the dogs. Right. So.